Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our virtual programming for the 157th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. My name is Christopher Gwynn. I'm one of the Rangers here at Gettysburg National Military Park, and we're so thankful that you're watching along, following us as we chronicle the 157th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. Today, we're at a really unique location on the battlefield, one that most visitors don't get to access, and it's the historic Harmon Farm on the first day's battlefield. In 2011, this property was transferred to the National Park Service, and it's really one of the hidden gems of Gettysburg National Military Park, in part because it has so many layers of history here. There's the pre-battle story, there's of course the battle story, but also this site helps us get a bit of an insight into the development of the Battlefield Park, its early memorialization, and I'm here with a great friend of Gettysburg National Military Park, Andrew Dalton. Andrew Dalton is director of Adams County Historical Society, and he has a really intimate connection with this particular property. So Andrew, can you tell us a little bit about Adams County Historical Society and also your connection to the Harmon Farm? Sure, yeah. Um, so I grew up just a, just a few hundred yards from here, actually. Uh, it's a, a beautiful property. We're so fortunate that the National Park Service has preserved it. Um, and I am now fortunate to be the executive director of ACHS, the Adams County Historical Society. Uh, we are kind of the, the community's archives um, and education center uh, for all things Adams County and Gettysburg history. Uh, we have a collection of over one million historic items uh, dating all the way back to uh, dinosaur footprints and then everything you could imagine uh, through the Battle of Gettysburg up through the Eisenhower era and beyond. Um, and one of our really prized collections is the civilian accounts of the Battle of Gettysburg. We have over uh, 300 original accounts uh, left by civilians, uh, letters, diaries, newspaper articles, uh, where these, these local citizens are recounting incredible events, um, some horrendous things that happened to them, uh, one of which we're going to talk about, and that's the story of the Harmon family that lived here on this property. So just to uh, kind of set the stage for our viewers, we're here at the Harmon farm. We're just west of Willoughby Run, so through this kind of thick scrub, we'd eventually get to that, that, that run, and just beyond it, of course, is Herbst Woods, one of the famous locations on the Gettysburg Battlefield. And behind you all, or behind the camera, are relatively open fields that would have, in 1863, belonged to the Harmon family. Is that correct, yeah, it is. Uh, Andrew? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about who was living here at the time of the battle? and then what they experienced uh, as the battle kind of unfolded. Yeah, so uh, there was a, a really beautiful two-story brick house along what is now Old Mill Road, which is a few hundred yards uh, to my left. Um, it was built in the 1830s uh, by a Reverend Charles G. McLean. Um, he and his wife actually happened to be the aunt and uncle of Stonewall Jackson's first wife, <laughs> Eleanor Junkin, the famous Confederate yeah. general. So there's a tie uh, to Stonewall Jackson with the early history of this property, which is kind of interesting, I think. Uh, but during the Civil War, the, the house uh, was occupied by a 16-year-old girl named Amelia Harmon, and she lived there with her aunt Rachel. And it was the two women. Uh, Rachel was married, but her husband had left with the horses before the battle, uh, which was very common for a lot of the civilians, uh, to get their horses out of the way of the Confederate mm -hmm. Army as it moved through uh, southern Pennsylvania. Um, so the Harmon women are there um, on the morning of July 1st on this beautiful farm, which is about a little over 100 acres. Um, and uh, like Chris said, the farm's today part of Gettysburg National Military Park, so you can come out and enjoy it. Uh, but Chris, maybe you could set up the events of the morning of July 1st, and then we can talk more mm. about what these women witnessed um, yeah. on, on the morning of the 1st. Absolutely, and I hope you have caught some of our earlier videos today. Uh, we had one that began early in the morning at what's called the First Shot Marker, the First Shot House by Ranger Shannon Walsh, and she kind of uh, laid out the initial cla clashes of the Battle of Gettysburg. So just to get everybody caught up, on June 30th, 1863, Union Cavalry, led by Brigadier General John Buford, as well as Confederate Infantry, led by a general named Johnston Pettigrew, would basically arrive in the town of Gettysburg at almost the same moment. Uh, John Buford and his cavalrymen, they're not expecting to see Confederate Infantry. Pettigrew and his North Carolinians, as they enter the town of Gettysburg along the Chambersburg Pike, they're not expecting to run into Union Cavalry, and he'll actually stop his command and head back to Cashtown, a few miles west of Gettysburg, where he reports to his division and ultimately his corps commander, General A.P. Hill, that he has spotted elements of the Union Army of the Potomac in Gettysburg. And the next morning, the, those uh, Confederates will decide to return to the community, to return to the town down the Chambersburg Road, which is just north of where we're standing right now, uh, basically conducting a reconnaissance in force. What is going on in the town of Gettysburg? Who are those Union troopers? And meanwhile, uh, John Buford, that Union Cavalry commander, he's decided to use the terrain west of Gettysburg, 
the rolling hills and ridges to try to delay those Confederates as long as possible. So a delaying action. He has a little under 2,000 troopers. He's gonna fight them dismounted. He'll put up his initial stand on, on Belmont Ridge and then Her Ridge, again, trying to delay those Confederates as long as he possibly can. And really, he's hoping to buy enough time for Union infantry of the 1st Army Corps, the better part of 10,000 men, led by Major General John Fulton Reynolds, to march and to arrive in Gettysburg and take over the situation. So again, he's simply trying to buy time. And that's really what he's able to do. Those Union cavalrymen delay the Confederates. Uh, the Confederates have to deploy. They have to uh, form battle lines. That takes a lot of time. Buford uh, stubbornly contests those Confederates as they begin to advance towards Gettysburg and really across the Harmon Farm property. If we were here early morning, July 1st, 1863, we might see those Union cavalrymen falling back and hot on their heels would have been a brigade of Tennessee and Alabama infantrymen, Confederates, led by a man named James Archer. James Archer is a brigadier general in the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, throughout most of the morning, his men have been driving back these Union cavalrymen. He's thinking one more big push and he might actually see the spires of the town of Gettysburg. He might actually drive those Union uh, troopers back. But at the last moment, about 10, 10.30 in the morning, Union infantry finally arrive on the battlefield. And again, these are men of the 1st Army Corps. In particular, these are men of the famous Iron Brigade, a brigade of Midwesterners, men from Michigan, men from Indiana, men from Wisconsin, some of the best fighters in the Union Army of the Potomac. And now, all of a sudden, uh, Archer, who's been facing cavalry for most of the morning, now finds himself confronting some of the best soldiers, some of the best infantrymen that the Union Army has. Archer's men would have crossed literally right over the land that we're standing on right now. They would have pushed past Willoughby Run through the trees behind me, through Herbst Woods, and it would be close to that spot that they'd encounter soldiers of the 2nd Wisconsin and John Fulton Reynolds himself as he's leading these men into battle. Uh, Reynolds will be killed. He's been on the field maybe 30 minutes before he's hit by a Confederate bullet. The men of the Iron Brigade, particularly the men of the 2nd Wisconsin, launch essentially a charge through the woods behind me and across Willoughby Run. They drive back Archer's men, and in one of the famous episodes of the battle, Archer himself is captured by a Union infantryman named Patrick Maloney of the 2nd Wisconsin, and Archer becomes the first Confederate general in the Army of Northern Virginia to be captured by the enemy. So the initial stages of battle here on the Harmon Farm were actually a success for the Union Army. Uh, Archer is captured. Confederates have been driven back. But at the same time this is happening, and as there's a, a lull in the, the battle during the midday period, there's some brutal skirmishing that will take place across the Harmon property itself, particularly the Harmon farm and house. And for that, I'm hoping, Andrew, you can fill us in a little bit on that episode of the battle. Sure. Yeah, so to point out again, Archer is captured west of Willoughby Run on this property, just a, a, a few hundred yards behind us, probably not even hmm. that much. Um, after Archer's captured, uh, as Chris said, uh, both armies kind of uh, reinforced their lines on the battlefield. There's a woodlot directly behind the camera. Uh, in later years, it was called the Springs Hotel Woods, um, and that would be a location where the Confederates would form their line of battle in preparation for an attack uh, in the afternoon of July 1st. Um, and the Union line would then develop on McPherson's Ridge across Willoughby Run behind me. Um, and the Union troops along McPherson's Ridge uh, sent out their skirmishers across Willoughby Run, um, and then you have Confederate skirmishers sent out as well. Um, what happens is the Confederate skirmishers gain the high ground near what, uh, where, near where the Harmon buildings are, were located along Old Mill Road. Um, those Confederates begin to fire across Willoughby's Run at McPherson's Ridge, causing a lot of trouble for the Union soldiers deployed along the ridge. Um, it's at this point uh, that a company of New Yorkers from the 80th New York Infantry is sent across Willoughby's Run. They charge up the hill. Um, there are several men killed and wounded during this encounter, and they charge up to the house. Now, by this point, Amelia Harmon and her aunt had been watching the battle unfold from their window. They saw the soldiers deploying. They saw this cavalry action earlier in the morning. But really, it doesn't hit home until they hear pounding on the door, uh, fists and guns. Um, and the uh, Union soldiers are yelling, open or we'll break down the doors. And so those women, they come down the stairs uh, from the second story windows. Uh, they open the door, a flood of, uh, they describe them as powder blackened blue coats. Uh, they rush into the house and then disperse out to the various windows of the house where they begin uh, sharpshooting at Confederates um, who were deployed in the uh, wood line behind the camera, um, which is on the base of uh, what is called Hers Ridge. Uh, so you have a Confederate line, and then you have Union skirmishers at the Harmon House, 
and the Union skirmishers uh, start doing exactly what the Confederates had been doing to them. Uh, they're firing at those lines and really harassing uh, the Confederates. Um, so then uh, during this lull, uh, there's, there's soldiers killed at the Harmon House. Uh, there's wounded taken back across the creek. Uh, it's a very bloody encounter uh, for skirmishing. Um, and the afternoon really develops when the Confederate attacks begin. Um, the Confederates get the order uh, to advance once again in force. Two entire divisions of Confederates come out of the woods behind the camera. Heath's division, which has seen action in the morning, and behind them, a fresh division of Confederates commanded by uh, General Dorsey Pender. Uh, so these two divisions move forward, um, and all of a sudden, um, at the Harmon House, things get quiet. Um, and Amelia Harmon, at this point, she and her, uh, her aunt are in the basement, um, and they're not sure what's going on. Uh, everything's become quiet, and all of a sudden, the sharp shooting from the windows above has stopped. And all of a sudden, what they see when they look out the cellar windows is a line of Confederate feet, uh, the Confederate infantry moving across the fields. Um, and uh, they're not sure what to do. Um, and uh, before too long, they see Confederates knocking at their door and barging in. Um, and what they find is the Confederates have started to light the house on fire. They look out the window, they see their barn is already on fire. Um, so there's this incredible struggle that then takes place between the Harmon women and these Confederates, trying to convince them not to burn the house. They stomp on the flame, they yell at the Confederates, they plead with them, don't burn the house. Um, you know, we had nothing to do with this. Uh, and so the Confederates decide, well, we're ordered to, uh, we have to burn it. Uh, they send the women out, um, and the women are out in the midst of this incredible battle, um, not sure what to do. They head back toward Hur's Ridge, and they actually have to pass through the Confederate lines. So there's this incredible dramatic scene taking place um, right outside the Harmon House. I think when you come out to a site like this today, I mean, it's so beautiful. Uh, it's so pastoral and peaceful. The, the, the scene that Andrew's just described, one of the things I think is really difficult for us to envision is just the scene of devastation and destruction that would have been across this property in the afternoon of July 1st, 1863, uh, with the Harmon Farm ablaze, with the wounded and dead littering the battlefield. And then, of course, Andrew mentioned that afternoon Confederate attack involving two Confederate divisions, Heath's division, and behind Heath, Pender's division. And this will set the stage for one of the epic regimental fights of the American Civil War between the 26th North Carolina and the men of the 24th Michigan of the Iron Brigade. Now, the 26th North Carolina was the largest Confederate regiment in the Army of Northern Virginia, nearly 800 men. They were commanded on July 1st, 1863 by a young colonel, barely in his 20s, named H. K. Burguin. And the men of the 26th North Carolina on the afternoon of July 1st would have literally passed right past where we're standing right now from behind the camera, past Andrew and I, across Willoughby Run. And it's there they'll run into the Union infantrymen of the 24th Michigan, led by Colonel Henry Monroe, Morrow rather. And again, this is one of the epic regimental battles of the American Civil War, where at times these two units, only, only a couple dozen yards apart, are dueling back and forth in this uh, storm uh, of lead and iron. Now, ultimately, uh, Burguin, that young colonel, would be killed. The men of the 24th Michigan would ultimately begin to give way, and Confederates would follow up that, uh, that victory by driving those Union defenders from Herps Woods, and then ultimately attacking them in their position on Seminary Ridge, which we will cover in a later video. And again, as the, the fighting dies down on July 1st, it's really difficult for us to imagine what the once peaceful Harmon Farm property uh, would have looked like. Uh, there would have been graves all over the, the property. There would have been wounded being tended to. And eventually this property would, would transition from a battlefield to a place where early memorialization efforts are gonna take place, where the tourist industry in Gettysburg is gonna take root. Uh, and just to give a little context to that before I turn it over to Andrew, I think it's important to mention that not long after the Battle of Gettysburg, the citizens of the community begin to preserve the battlefield. They create an organization called the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association to begin to preserve bits of the battlefield landscape as a monument, as a memorial to the Union men that fought here. And over time, over years, Visitors, veterans, family members start to return to Gettysburg to see where this epic battle was fought. And here on the Harmon Farm property, uh, again, the early tourist industry is going to take root. 
And for that, I wonder if, Andrew, you could fill us in a little bit on the hotel that's going to be, yeah, be placed here. So w like many other of the residents and, and uh, property owners in Gettysburg, I'm, his crops were destroyed, his orchard was destroyed, his house and barn, unlike many other structures, but this is one of the only places where a, a house and barn were actually burned uh, during the course of the fighting. Uh, so Emmanuel Harmon's looking for, for ways to, to gain uh, off of this tremendous loss. And one of them is by advertising the water from a spring on his property as medicinal. And we're actually standing just a few feet uh, from this historic spring. It's a little bit off uh, on the side and buried in the brush. Uh, but in 1865, the water was analyzed for the first time. And this was part of a craze that was taking over the, the nation as well as uh, other portions of the world, uh, mineral water and mineral springs resorts. And so uh, by 1868 into 1869, uh, the spring had gained so much popularity um, that they constructed a hotel on this property known as the Gettysburg Springs Hotel. Um, the hotel stood until 1917, and for the many years um, that it was here, it was one of the premier locations for veterans reunions, uh, for gatherings of, of tourists. There was a cupola that was an observatory for the battlefield um, on top of this massive four-story hotel. Um, so the Springs Hotel is an example of that early effort uh, where you see commercialization and preservation kind of mixing. And there were many nights where you could visit the hotel and uh, you could walk up to the porch and, and talk to generals like Daniel Sickles and James Longstreet, who would just be sitting um, in rocking chairs on the large veranda porch, talking to the visitors and explaining their part in the Battle of Gettysburg. In 2011, as we mentioned earlier, this property was acquired by the National Park Service. And this is such a wonderful example of a place where you can go to see all of these different layers of history, all of these different chapters of the Gettysburg story. And we're so grateful to the Adams County Historical Society and Andrew Dalton for taking us out here and showing us a little bit of this, uh, this story on the anniversary of the battle. Thank you for watching. Please keep tuned to our Facebook Live channel uh, throughout the day as additional videos will be posted. And uh, as always, thanks for tagging along. We appreciate it.